No demon. No his his manumics. No his manumics. Yeah. His manumics. All right. Uh, so I guess we'll get started, and uh, we're starting early, so I'll try to finish early. Uh, so and it'll go great. So let's uh, take a few moments to, to pray. Make sure we're in, uh, taken care of and with our mind set on uh, looking into the Word, making sure that we ask the Lord to uh, interpret for us, give us the illumination to make sure that we, what we're uh, understanding is clearly coming from His Word so that we can uh, apply it in a way that brings Him glory. But let's take a few moments if you, in the privacy of your priesthood uh, to confess uh, your sin and, and then we'll begin today's uh, lesson. We'll do it quietly and then I'll start off in prayer. Father, we come before you, give you thanks for your care, your blessing. Pray that your Holy Spirit may enlighten, may clear to us your truth, so that we'll be able to apply it properly and rightly dividing the word of truth, so you may be glorified. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. <clears throat> yeah, so today is basically the, probably the last, uh, last of the sessions on hermeneutics. Uh, we're... Uh, coming to the point where this is Hermeneutics Quiz 3, which is covering the application. Uh, we did that for, as we said, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Now we're going to do the same thing for 1 John uh, 6, verses 6 and 7, chapter 1, 6 and 7. Uh, just to remind us, uh, let's take a few moments and start recording. And there it is. So, in this Hermeneutics Quiz 3, we were going over 1 John verse, uh, chapter 1, 6, and 7, which reads, uh, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, and yet keep walking in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus uh, his son cleanses us from all sin and uh, we were bringing out we already looked at the context uh, uh, and previously we saw what each one of these words mean, meant and then we saw the context in the whole book how John is going through in his epistle kind of talk about how to maintain fellowship and what that mean and what does that look like in, in how we treat others and everything. Love, God is love and God is light means we're not walking in darkness. The idea we don't walk in or we don't carry our living the way we live apart from having the light of the word on looking at what we're doing and, and trying to be in fellowship with the Lord. And we said, oh, well, this passage just tells us that, uh, that you can be deceived, right? And then we'll see the first question that we're going to go through is, as, as I said, this, these are the same questions, but then with a little bit um, added detail. It says the who, right? They're saying, what does this passage teach me about God? Uh, according to this one passage, it says God is light. So, again, we re recognize that's really speaking of his essence, having to do with who, his purity and integrity and who and what is. That's light in that sense and also illumination right gives us uh, ability to understand and then we saw what does this passage teach me about the church okay in this case there's no church uh, really mentioned here it is you know we, we know we're talking about fellowship means within church membership and church members believers but in, in explicitly it doesn't really cover anything about the church uh, in that sense. What does this patch is teach me about the world? Well, again, uh, darkness, uh, if I were to say, well, what, what uh, we say if God is light, and if you're apart from God, then you're in darkness, uh, and, and he also used, we, we saw how darkness uh, causes them blindness, not being able to know, and they easily trip over themselves, but that's the world. Uh, but this passage is relating to believers because remember he's saying if we 
you know, uh, say, right? And if we walk in, the, in darkness, but if we lie and do not, so it's talking about us, okay? Not the world, I'm talking about believers in this sense, in the context. But one of the things it says, what does this passage teach me about myself? Well, according to this, I could think I'm in fellowship, but in fact lie and not really practice the truth. So there's people that are believers that, that I think that's what John is bringing out, that, that think they're in fellowship with God. Uh, but in actuality, not practicing the truth, therefore they're not in fellowship with God. So that, that's what this tells me. So I, we know that here we're talking about believers, not unbelievers. Not, unbelievers are not in this passage, not in this epistle. Remember, Paul, John is writing to believers. So it says believers can be uh, think they're in fellowship, but in actuality, you can be lying to yourself. You know, I could be there. So that's how I apply it to myself. Yes, I could be deceived. So therefore, he said, what kind of person should I be or not be? I must be cleansed, in other words, from sin in order for to have fellowship with God. That's what this passage is saying. It's saying that in order to be cleansed, the blood of Jesus Christ does that in order for me to have fellowship and be walking in the light the way God wants me to. That's what, it isn't telling me how do I do that. It isn't giving me the mechanics. And that's where, that's why I was, uh, I want you to understand, uh, when you look at the scripture, sometimes it just tells you a fact. You can be walking in darkness, walking in the light. You can, if you're in the light, the blood of Christ washes you of sin doesn't say exactly what do you do to get there okay and that for that we have to see <laughs> the next verses afterwards right are you already on another page here uh no i'm right here still uh i uh, ABC. i didn't yeah abc a but it should have been d and e okay i don't know why it's not showing up but that's uh the secretary i got to fire him <laughs> <laughs> the, d, the d was uh what does it show me about myself what does it? this passage teach me about myself and then E was what kind of person should I be or not be? I should not, I should be a person in fellowship. That's what I should be. That's what I see in this passage. I, it's gearing, it's giving me a, a direction to go. Okay. So now, how? Okay. Uh, and that's the that's the next uh, next question. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I did. <laughs> I must have split up the uh, the thing to be two. We're still on who? Yeah, still on one. Who? Yeah. And this is where it says, "What does this passage teach me about myself?" I and then what it tells me is that a believer, I could be in darkness, out of fellowship. I might think I'm in fellowship because that's just if I say, I mean, I'm claiming that's the claim I'm making. Uh, that I'm in fellowship, but yet, in fact, lie, lie, and not practice the truth. So if I don't practice the truth, I'm lying to myself. Okay. And then we said, what kind of person should I or not uh, be or not be? It says uh, I should be a person cleansed. So I, I must be cleansed uh, from sin in order to have fellowship with God. God is not going to accept me. I can't walk right up to God with my sinful sins without being con uh, uh, cleansed and, and I think that I'm going to have fellowship with them. It's, it's something that has to happen. A process has to happen. And that's why, you know, I'm, I say I'm a mechanical engineer, so I always look for mechanics. <laughs> I look for, you tell me something, you know, be holy as I am holy. holy. I said, God, what? that's great and dandy and you're telling me I should do that, but how? What do I need to do? Should always be kind of how do I put the, the 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 thought, the idea onto rubber to the road? Okay. So here's where the next question comes in. Uh, action or activity? What action should I uh, not take? For example, should I uh, not take? It says I must be cleansed from all sin. So I, that's an action that I should take, and I should be still dirty. Uh, that's that's what I understand from this passage, these two verses. And then which mission should I support or start? What When I say mission, I'm saying what what should I 
take on as a task that I'm going to be doing in order to, for this, according to this passage, what should I be, be thinking about doing? Well, I, you know, if, if I learn how to do this, uh, to be cleansed, then I'm going to train others how to be cleansed from all sin. So, it, it, in other words, this passage doesn't tell me how, but I, I do need to find out how so I can do it myself and train others. So my mission is going to be to be able to train others how to be cleansed from sin. Okay? Make sense so far? Yes. Have I, well done, okay. yes. <laughs> Just the idea of how. Uh, the, what actions should I not take? Or should I take or not take, right? Uh, uh, and then I said, I must be cleansed from all sin. That's something this passage is telling me. In order to be in fellowship, i got to make sure I'm cleansed, okay? By the blood of Christ. Now, how do I do that? And then which mission should I take? I said, well, or start. I said, well, I'm going to put together some, train others to not, uh, in order to, to be able to be cleansed. So if I do that, then I'm going to have to find out how. And then, according to this, uh, the third question, uh, things or ideas, remember? Uh, what ideal should I have or not have? Well, the ideal, I do not assume you are in fellowship with God. That's the idea. Say, don't take to heart and just say, I'm in fellowship. Just because I believed in Jesus Christ a long time ago, I, I'm in fellowship with God. Because remember, here's John, who's an apostle, who's talking about himself. If I, <laughs> so I, I think he brings himself in that in that same box, in that same situation. So don't assume that you're in fellowship with God just because you're a believer. How long you've been a believer? How many times you went to church? Don't assume it. Right? What doctrines were illustrated or defined? According to this, the doctrine, when I say the teaching, is fellowship is dependent on being cleansed by the blood of Christ. And I want you to remember how we, we determined this cleansing. It wasn't had been cleansed, cleanses. Notice that it's a present tense, means it, it's a continual action, something that keeps on going. It wasn't, yeah, I was. it's right, I, when I first believed in Jesus Christ, I was cleansed at that moment in time. But I got dirty after that. I still sin. There's still sin that, that, that's, that, that we have still the old sin nature within us. Our tendency to, to sin is still there. <clears throat> so, uh, so we see that the, the doctrine says fellowship is dependent on this cleansing on a continual action but of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what I find in this passage based on as we've gone through and we're trying, we've uh, translated this, you know, uh, translated, I'm not trying, uh, interpreted this passage, that's what it's telling me. Okay? Uh, and, uh, let's see, do we have, um, no, I don't. Okay. Why? We always, like I said, we always ask, well, why is these two verses uh, important to me? Because why should I or I, what? Mm, why should I or should I not do uh, what it says in this passage? Uh, in this case, do not be deceive, deceived. That's something I shouldn't be. According to the passage, it says, uh, if we say we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And then it says, so there's this idea that if I claim or say something and I'm not, then I'm actually still being deceived. And then I should, on the other hand, remain in fellowship. That's something that we want to do, right? I don't know about any of you, but as Christians, <laughs> it should be a goal of ours to, to always be in fellowship with God. It's, it, it should be a goal. So that's, that's what I... In these two verses, remember, I haven't gone. I'm not talking about the whole book yet, but in these two verses, that's what we get, and how I'm going to apply it in my life. Uh, Got to remain in fellowship. <coughs> when should I apply uh, what I have learned? 
And I, I find that this is telling me something I should do this every day. Be cleansed on a regular basis, on a moment by moment basis. In other words, uh, how long do you want to be in fellowship with God? Do you want to do it just on Sundays <laughs> or just on Wednesdays or, or just an hour a day or 10 minutes a day or just, you know, so I, I, and how I, I said, when should I, I should always be in fellowship with God as much as I can be and as all at every after every time that I, I got as I'm alive, I want to have that fellowship with God. Uh, and so uh, you see what I'm saying. This is how we're taking just these two verses and we're just applying it to using these questions. Okay? Any any thoughts? Anything that uh, may be not clear or something? Yeah? I was telling Jimmy the other day, I says, you know, you, you go along and you think, well, I'm, I'm in fellowship, all right. And I said, then you start thinking about it. And all at once you think of something that you've done that you just didn't even think about this being sin, but yep. it is. Or mm -hmm. if you, you've done this, you've done this little something, and you've done that little something, you just don't even think about it till you start zeroing in. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and that's where I think, you know, the, the, the idea is that once we do know that we have sinned, then it's time mm -hmm. to get, try to get back into fellowship. Mm -hmm. As soon as you realize, it's, okay, I've done this, or I just said something, or I thought something, you know, judgmental, prejudice, whatever, any time, then I say at that moment in time is the time to, to, to go back and, and get back in fellowship. Don't let the sun set on your sin. Don't let it. Is, 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 a, um, is a term that applies to moment by moment just because yeah. the sun's setting. All the time, somewhere on somewhere on <laughs> exactly. So it, it, it is. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, as soon as soon as it, we reflect on it, and that's why, you know, there's these other examples where Paul talks about these people that were eating uh, and drinking the blood, uh, the, the the Lord's Supper, in an unworthy manner, and then he says, and that's why some of you are sick, some of you are weak. And some have fallen asleep. Yes. I think those are three levels of, of discipline God call, brings down on people that don't. Uh, and it says, but if we examine ourselves, you know, that, you know, before you eat the Lord's Supper, make sure you examine yourselves. For what? Just to say, okay, yeah, I got four bad things. Okay. That, no, I think there's a, something to do with those. Run to the Lord. Much like David, when, when Nathan says, you're the man. You're the one that sinned. He says, I have sinned against thee and thee alone. And that's where, that's why David was a man after God's own heart. It wasn't because he was perfect and never messed up. He messed up a lot of times. And so it's written down for us to, to see that. But he knew what to do when he was called on the carpet. And he, you know, I've sinned. When he sees the angel coming in and destroying the city, he says, Let, let's go over there and make that altar. And then he told him, the guy says, oh, here, I'm going to give you the land. I'll give you the bull. He said, no, 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 no. Can't be that. I have to pay <laughs> for everything. And then I can give us that. And then the angel, the Lord said, stop. Discipline is finished. It stopped at that point in time. And I think that's where we, we, we are able to do that. We, as pre priests now, remember in the Old Testament, people had to go to the priest and have that done. Uh, most of the time, the old, before the law, it was the eldest of the family, the father, like Job, he'd, he'd do it, or Abraham, you know, and then Moses. But then we see once the Levitical priesthood came in, now they, that was their job, is to go before the Lord, confess the, uh, as the sins came in, people came in, they had to come in with their offering, and they confessed, and then the priest would put his hand over the offering and over the head of the individual, like he's transferring sin to that animal, and then it was cut. And then that's that's the same kind of thing that we're doing every time we come to the Lord uh, for that cleansing. And uh, we see that, so a moment-by-moment -moment basis means any time. As soon as you think that there's something out of land, you know, I, every time I hit my, my hand with the hammer or something, oh, Lord, okay, did I do something wrong? <laughs> I'm just going to assume 
I assume I've done something wrong. Then I pray, Lord, forgive me for my whatever failure in any way. So I, I do it at that second, and then I say, okay, if the suffering or everything continues on, it's no longer for discipline, it's for strengthening my faith. So, moment by moment basis. That, at least that's how I'm going to apply it. <laughs> you guys have to come up with, <laughs> with how you're going to do this. Right? Should be continuous. Yes, it continues like a hecking cough kind of a thing. That's why we're always ready to pray. That's what Paul says, you know, pray with the, with the consistency of a hacking cough. Uh, same way, I, you know, we pray, and first thing I do is put that in the menu, confession of sin. Get that out of the way. And then where? It says, where should I apply what I have learned? And this, remember, I'm just using these two verses. I'm going to apply it everywhere, any place I'm at whether at home or in the road, when that guy crosses over <laughs> on the highway and, well, okay, but forgive me. Or I do it. I cross over. That guy goes from the left line to make a right turn. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's everywhere, and there is no place. We don't have to go to the altar. Like the, the Old Testament believers, they had to go to the Jerusalem. They had to go to the priest and have them do the uh, intercession for them. That's what the priest was doing. But well, now we have only one mediator between man and God. The Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ. So we can go directly. And that's why in, in, later in chapter 2 of, of John, it goes on and says, you know, I'm writing you little children uh, that You're your sins that. have been forgiven because of, of his name. I'm writing to you, Father. Oh, well, I'm sorry. That was the other. What did I do? Yeah, it's time to start. It's time to start. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. We can so, so here, uh, uh, it's in 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 this uh, chapter two. He says, "My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin." So there's a purpose. We not to say, "Well, okay, great, I can go sin, do whatever." No, he's saying not to sin. But what is I the the rest of that verse? But if anyone does sin. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he himself is atoning sacrifice uh, for our sins. And not only our, ours, but also for the uh, whole world. So uh, an advocate, that's a lawyer. And that's in this, why need a lawyer? Because you're going to be guilty. <laughs> We're going to sin. We're going to mess up. He's there all of the time ready to stand and say, Father, walk in, I walk into the courtroom to the Father and say, Father, I've sinned, I've failed, I've done this. And then Jesus stands up and says, Father, I died for those sins. Acquitted. We're, we're not that we're uh, not guilty in a sense, but God says it's been paid for. Justified. Okay? So, and, that's, and that's where, that, that's why we should be able to do it anywhere. Now, like in the Old Testament, they had restrictions. They had to go through the, the priest and had to do those uh, uh, sacrifices for sin. George, I want to back up because I had to run away from No, you. no problem. Uh, I've always thought about this. The preacher disagrees, Smith. You probably will too, but yeah. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but in the verse where it says if you're... You take of the communion unworthily, and yes. that's why some of you. Right. I've always taken that to mean not just the one that's unworthy, mm -hmm. but what affects one affects the whole body, and some in the body may be sick because you're unworthy. Well, but what makes me worthy for communion is uh, Jesus. He's the only worthy one. So well, and, and, and that, in that passage, we can go to that passage. But in that passage, is that's why some of you are sick and some of you. And then it says what the what the solution that he gives isn't saying that uh, that uh, isn't really the the idea of everybody else. You don't. I don't confess to sin or examine other people. Oh, you examine yourself, and and that's what that passage is. Examine yourself, but it just and seems to me like that when we do we may yeah we it will impact other people. Affect the whole no body. doubt, we no doubt. Much like body. David's sin, 
his, you know, his adultery. Well, what did he do? He actually killed Uriah. I think he offended him. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, him. you know, exactly. So, yeah, sin does that. But individually, God is holding you responsible for what you do with your acts, your sin, individually. And that's why I say examine yourself. It doesn't examine the brother, your brethren, examine all the church. It's like examine yourself. Well, no, I didn't say examine yeah. the others, but no. I'm just saying. But that, that's how we do, do that. If I do something wrong, yeah. it, it's going to affect the whole body. Oh, yeah. So it's, I need to be very careful. Yeah. About myself. Yep. Too. And then, but that's the, that's your responsibility is you. Yeah. I don't have the responsibility for others that in verse, their sense. That verse is in First Corinthians eleven and verse Go. verse twenty nine. Go ahead, John. John. See, he disagrees with John. No. Okay. John. Hmm? Verse twenty nine in that First Corinthians eleven says, okay. "For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself." Right. Not discerning the Lord's body. So it, it, it's the individual that he's calling out in that sense. I think that what makes me worthy is that Jesus lives in me, and Jesus is the only worthy one. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's a fact. Worthy. The only reason I can go to the Father and confess my sin, it's because my relationship with the Son. If it wasn't for that, I have no rights. I have no standing. <laughs> you know, an unbeliever well, going yes. could confess and feel sorry. What did Judas do? See, that's Judas, for example, he felt sorry for what he had done. He says, I've, you know, I've betrayed innocent blood. And what did he do? He felt so sorry that he went hung, hung himself. Did that save him? No. See, feeling sorry for the sin, or it, it doesn't do it. It's because he, all he had to do, what he needed to do, is what the thief on the cross did. Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. Yeah. In other words, you see what I'm saying? That's the reason that person is in heaven, not because, you know, because he says, you know, we're murderers, we killed, we brought, we're, we're here because we deserve it. He's saying that because if it was based on his merit, he's got no standing. But he's That's asking amazing. grace. He asked in grace to Jesus, remember me when you enter into the kingdom. You follow That's the same? reason the we difference? can't expect an unbeliever to to walk in the light. Nope, exactly. We can't expect it. And yet we do it all the time. I say, I wonder why he don't do that and he does this and he yep. doesn't do that. Nope. He's an unbeliever. That, the Bible doesn't right. even apply to him. He don't understand it. It's right. foolishness to him. Exactly. So. Exactly. All right, so we talked about everywhere and then we said extent, measure, quantity, or quality. At what level should I apply what you have learned? He says, uh, what level? In other words, I make it a priority the highest priority before I pray before I sing as part of my any any prayer if I'm going to eat <laughs> Father forgive us if we failed you if sin, to make it a habit a good that's a good habit you know mm -hmm. you know just to pronounce and say the only reason and then it says in the name what does that mean in the name of Jesus Christ it means based on who and what he is his power his 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 integrity his work on the cross for me that's that's what the name it really implies it doesn't just because jesus it's not just a magic word you know that that just by saying that it it has to do with i'm claiming his who and what he is his integrity and what he's done on the cross and everything about him that's why i can go to the father and that's why he says you can be confident and go to the father uh, and ask and things of that type. I'll ask in my name. So, and then, and then uh, when we talk about co quantity or quality, well, and quantity, I'm saying all sin. There's no sin. No, no, it isn't one that asks too little. It does, doesn't doesn't merit my time to confess it, or it's too big. Some people have that idea. God can't forgive me. I I've done something so terrible. Uh, that, you know, God can't forgive me. No, it's all. Jesus Christ died for all men's sins, for all sin. Mm -hmm. So that's where uh, we, we can make it a priority and then make it something that uh, at every time that I can, I'll make it. And that's where we see 1 John 1, 9 continues in the same context, right? He says, um, if we say that we do not bear guilt of sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
But if we confess, notice here, but if we confess, and if you know what confess, it's just basically agreeing with God. We're, we're just, uh, 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 you're, you're, claim, you're, you're claiming, you're in the court, in the court before the Father, and it's um, claiming the, the work of Christ on the cross. And, and here's my sin. Here's what I, my guilt, my things I've done wrong. And then is when we, we basically say, and then God the Father says, yeah, that's, that's judgment. <laughs> it's already been passed. It's already taken care of. I can forgive you uh, of sin. And that's where it goes on to say that uh, we confess our sins. That's the little part that we do. We don't, we don't do a lot more. It isn't saying, we promise God, I won't do it again. <laughs> You know, or we lie. Or, <laughs> exactly. God isn't asking that from us. Notice what it does. Confess our sin. That's it. That's the only responsibility uh, for a believer is for us to confess sin. I'm not going to tell this to an unbeliever. Confess your sin or you know, feel sorry for your sin and then come to the Lord. Why? Because it does no good. It has no value. It's only a confession of sin is only from a believer that has value in the eyes of God. Feeling sorry for sin and all that, it, it, or trying to make a deal with God. God, if you do this for me, I promise I'm going to be faithful at church or something. No, it isn't asking all this. Con the only thing he's asking right here is confession. It's recognizing that we have failed. It's taking responsibility. Isn't that what we want to do or have our children do? Let's take responsibility for what they do wrong and what to do right. I mean, mainly what to do wrong. Doing right, <laughs> that's, the, that's the easy part. Uh, the, the part that we want them to do is say, no, if, you, if you've done this wrong, then okay, take responsibility. And there's going to be penalty sometimes. But here, uh, God promises, in other words, the rest of this is really 100%, the rest is God. Every Right after we confess, the rest of this passage this goes on to say he it just starts off he is faithful what's the faithful mean he's consistent he'll always do it seven days a week 24 hours a day there's no time he don't take time off he doesn't go to the to the, uh, take his rest sleep nothing he's there on money and righteous and that's the real important part see if God were to be like you know Sometimes we as grandparents or something, we, ah, uh, child does this, no problem. That's okay. Yeah, he slapped me, but that's okay. It just wasn't mean anything. He didn't try to do it. No. <laughs> I want you to understand. Here, the reason God can, uh, can forgive us is because he is righteous. And he's already poured all of his wrath out on Jesus Christ. On Jesus Christ. He, uh, exactly. So that's why he's faithful. He's righteous. To, uh, forgive us forgiving our sins and then this is a good the rest of the, this is the part that really helps me out because I got a bad memory and cleanses us from all unrighteousness and that when, when you read that you understand that that's really saying when it says all unrighteousness not some just a little you know we'll race a few demerits off it means everything you, you've got a clean slate and that's the and that this is how I can fulfill that commandment that God says, be holy just as I am holy. Well, separated from sin. He did that when I, and until the next time I sin. Of course, he doesn't say, well, you will not sin anymore. Because that's what this whole passage talks about. He says, if we say we don't have sin and we don't need to confess, then that's the problem. And that's where we're in this passage, I think, is trying to clear up. This is how you regain fellowship with him by confession of sin. That's what's related. You know, verse nine is related to verse six and seven, and that's or in verse seven because in verse seven we saw that if we walk in light, he in light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So the cleansing happens after I confessed. You see the connection in the context. That's how we get to. And that's one of the important parts of our hermeneutics is always looking at context and see how one these this verse fits 
with uh, these two verses fit with the rest of the passage. All right. Uh, so uh, now, because as I said, that's what I thought. We we're going to get er done early. That's the end of that slideshow. Uh, so, <clears throat> any questions? Any anything that uh, you know? You say, well, maybe you've overstepped the interpretation. I, I think I've. Uh, in this class, we've gone through Second uh, Timothy three sixteen and seventeen, and seeing that you know that's why we can talk about a closed canon. We saw that uh, the scriptures complete everything I need is there to to do all good works. There's no no need for additional. I remember I was just watching a, a debate between. Uh, a Mormon and a Christians, and they were going back and forth with the ultimate, what is your ultimate uh, authority of, you know, well, they said the, the burning to the bosom for them, or no, it, you know, you can have still apostles and prophets today, and I say, well, doesn't that mean that the word is not complete, that, you know, other God is still speaking or has more to say, yeah. or is the scripture, like we said, this is all scriptures, God breathed and profitable for doctrine, means the teaching, reproof, for, for correction, to fix the things that we have, and, uh, and instruction in righteousness, how to walk in a righteous manner. So that, and there's a purpose, so that a man of God, a person that's a believer and mature, he says, so that he'll be complete, equipped to do all good works. And I'm saying, once it told me that, even though it was, when was that written? Was that written when the canon was completed? No, it was not. Remember, that's written to by Paul to Timothy, and that's before, probably before AD 70, because Paul gets killed around uh, 65 or something like that, uh, uh, AD. So it's before the fall of Jerusalem. There's still, what is still left? Well, you still got John's epistles. Those aren't written, and also the book of Revelation, Revelation is not written. But is the book of Revelation giving me anything more to how I'm supposed to live? I think when Paul finished his, his writings, he's given us everything we need to operate on this earth. Yes, Revelation gives us uh, things that, that have to do with the future during the seven years of tribulation, chapter 4 to uh, 19. That's, that's all seven years. That's what's going to be going on. The, the letters to the churches, it just given us the little breakdown of here's what's how what we learned by Paul and you know how it's being applied in these seven churches. And it's kind of gives us a, an outline of how uh, like the book of uh, the book of Ephesians, for example, um, is a letter that Paul writes, but then we also have a letter to the Eph Ephesus, to the Ephesians by John. And you're talking about maybe 20, 30 years in between. And we're saying, well, what's going on? And you have left your first love. You know, okay. Well, evidently they were doing fine for when Paul was writing because there is no real identification of any problems in the book of Ephesus. But in Ephesians it says, yeah, God says, Jesus said, yeah, there's a lot of good things you're doing and everything, but I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Yeah, doctrine-wise they were straight. But this part is here is how do you uh, treat others and things of that type. And we, that's what I'm trying to say is that, yes, I think it gives an illustration. And then so it's for day, for today. Now that it's past that the book is finished, we can look back and say, okay, here's what Paul instructed. Here's what John is saying is going on through those seven churches. Or Jesus is saying this is going on in the seven churches. So we, we can find out, okay, here's where they deviated. We better not do that. So it's good examples, much like the Old Testament for us was. Uh, a lot of things that are written there are for our benefit, mm -hmm. but for examples that we draw upon. The book of uh, mm -hmm. what David did, the judgments, how God <laughs> operated uh, with Israel. Of Here he's a chosen people. He does everything for them. But did he reject them? Did he reject them? Well, God disciplines, disciplines. So we say, okay, we don't want to be like those guys. But when then we find, you know, nuggets like Daniel. Here's Daniel. He's a young man, um, you know, a teenager. 
He's taken off to Babylon. He's in there for more than he's 80 or something for 70 years for the, of the of the exile plus a few more years and he even goes with other but we see there's nothing bad spoken about Daniel look at all the other other people in the Bible most of them they speak there's something spoken about them uh, that you know, even Jesus Christ they spoke bad about him of course it was a lie <laughs> but, but for Daniel I mean there was you can't find you, you won't you look through the scriptures you don't find anything bad said about him. You know, that his integrity, even his enemies, when they were trying to get him in trouble, yeah. you know, and they said, let's make this rule. You can't pray to other gods. But well, he says, if we don't do it on his faith stuff, then <laughs> we can't yeah, find yeah. anything wrong. He doesn't do it, steal, he doesn't take bribes. So it says, and so it tells us a lot. So we see nuggets like that. Then but then Daniel the himself, you know, says he has some sense to confess or something like that. Well, Even Dan though no one else says anything bad against oh, yeah. him. Well, see, he, when Daniel confesses, he's confessing for his people. He talks about, uh, because he knew that the 70 years were over, God said in Jeremiah, that you'll be in Babylon for 70 years. And then I will take you out. So uh, he knew that that was coming to an end. So he comes before God. And yeah, I'm sure... He's still, he's human. Yeah. So there was sin there. But I'm saying there is no, of himself he'll say. Yeah. But but I'm saying that people, even his enemies, would couldn't yeah. find an issue uh, about his integrity. And the scripture does not highlight yeah. his enemy. Yeah. And the scripture yeah. is truthful. And yeah, so if it, it was any defect, <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, but we find that he's a person that, uh, that's like that. We see, uh, for me, one of the examples was somebody like, Moses, I'm saying, here's a guy. God says, okay, you're you're gonna get prepared. You get born. We're gonna put you in Egypt. You're gonna learn how to write, read, uh, all these other technical stuff. That's fine. Okay, you're 40 years old. Uh, you're not ready. They put you out here to handle sheep for 40 years. You know. Okay. In a family. Now, and then a family and everything. And then you say, okay, okay. I think now you're ready to go do this task. So he goes there and he and he's doing fine for taking the people out, does the miracles, all that stuff. And then he he's in the these guys mess up. They you know they they say no God, we came out here. We're going into the promised land. There's giants there. We're gonna die here. And that's after a year coming from Egypt to the to the promised land. And then and then they just cry the blues. And then God said, okay, you didn't want to go. You're not going. You're gonna die here on this side. And you're going to be here 40 years. It was 40 days you were in there. 40 years you're going to be out here dying. And until the last one that's 20 years and older will die. Except for Caleb and Joshua. Then you can go in. And then Moses is doing fine up to this point. Right at the end. I mean, I, I it scares me. You know, when you see at the end of his almost life. Then he... Uh, uh, he comes and he gets angry at the people because the people say, "You brought, we're dying, we're starving, we're you know, going to die of thirst." And, all. And, and then he said, "God says, okay, go over to that rock, and I want you to speak to the rock, and yeah. water will come out." I said, "Okay." He goes up to the rock. And he says, "No." Let me talk to the people. You idiot! You stiff-necked people and everything. <laughs> and he and he speaks to them, and, and just. And then he takes his rod, and he hits the rock, and he hits it again, and then water comes out. And I says, okay, God, you know. He pulls him aside. He says, okay, Moses, because what you did, you're not going into the promised land. I said, wait, God, 120 years almost. And you're going to, can't even go into, can I even look at it? Well, okay, I'll let you look at it. But that's about it. Somebody said that God let Moses spend 40 years thinking he was somebody. Then he spent 40 years finding out he was nobody. Then he spent 40 years finding out what God can do with nobody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, but he's, still, but he's say, still highly... Hi, oh, yeah. In, in, no. in God's book. In God's book. in the no transfiguration, doubt. he was one of the ones well, that the came two, to the Jesus The two witnesses. I think he's going to be two witnesses. One of the two that will be come back because of the Elijah... Moses. And Moses were the only one. And we, they're not buried. Well, or at least the body was taken care of by the angel, guarded from Satan. And then uh, Moses and then Elijah went up in the chariot. 
uh, and they're Jews. Uh, and those, the seven years are related to the Jewish nation. So I think that's why they're the two that are coming back. Uh, and then it says, then you die. I'll let you <laughs> die there again. Uh, but yeah, so uh, one of the things I said, uh, hopefully this time has been good, uh, spending time going through these uh, uh, passages, these two that we looked at. We, we did a complete look at the whole books, two books of the Bible. And hopefully that's how kind of approach you can take when you read uh, a scripture. Don't just listen and say, here's this one verse and this is what I think it means. But do this investigation. Uh, I think earlier, I think uh, earlier when the American education system was put together, it was a good one because it had to do with rhetoric. Uh, it had to do with this question that people weren't just sit up there, sit down at the, at the, uh, the students weren't just sit there and, and, and just listen and, and repeat the, what the teacher says. And that's how the education goes on today. Back then there was things like, no, I'm going to ask you a question and then you, you're going to be a debate between this group of students and this group of students, and you're going to answer, uh, support your conclusions, your, uh, your, your claims. Now, if you give me a claim, it's got to be logical, connect each one of them. And there were things like uh, what's it, oh, the Boston Tea Party. Uh, were the, were the uh, citizens there correct or incorrect? And we're talking about 12 year olds at that time. This is the kind of questions that would be asked uh, to debate and go through. And so in that sense, it was more of catech catechism, the idea of teaching people to, to think, not give them the answer and here, this is just, I want you to repeat what I say. It's the responsibility was in the students and that's how they grew. And that's why I think we've, we've lost that. Mm -hmm. I think nowadays what we need to do is regain that. And this, these seven questions are what, you know, what I would say a basis of how you can look at any issue, whether you're talking about, you know, and looking at someone, a child did something, they dropped. Well, you can use all seven questions. Who did it? Who else is here? <laughs> um, when did this happen? Well, you were here when it happened and who else was here? <laughs> So, you know, you, you go through all of the questions and teaching them, well, this is how you investigate. You don't say, I assume. Yeah, you, you did it. And so here's, here's, here's the spanking. No, let's, uh, let's, let's investigate. You can see how you, you evaluate before you come to a conclusion. And then they'll, they'll see that, that maybe that's a, uh, what you call it, a skill that they'll pick up and actually use you know, the rest of their lives. It's half the law and studying this is half the law and studying our Sunday school lesson and being in Sunday school. Yeah, yeah, uh, hopeful, hopeful. Uh, okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we give you thanks for this time you've given us. We pray that you might continue to work in our hearts and minds, that we, as we've gone through this class of hermeneutics, Father, that you might be able to use that to tickle our brains and make it uh, useful in our uh, continuing uh, growth and toward the idea of rightly dividing the word of truth, Father, so we can uh, properly apply it in a way that will bring you the most glory and the most honor. We ask for your help as we continue back home and protection and all that we need, Father. Uh, we pray that uh, you might be with us and that you may be glorified. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.